Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, honoring Arbor Day on April 26th with an ongoing commitment to sustainable stewardship and conservation of Missouri's forests. Choosewood.com. From St. Louis Public Radio. This is St. Louis on the Air. Um, she worked with very closely with Dr. King's um, um, group, and I think they were pleased to have her, her stand before them and with them on an equal footing. But she just forged ahead. She didn't let things stop her from, from doing well, and she did well because she practiced and made herself good at what she did. She learned all of the performance steps in the chorus line so that she could, in fact, be able to take the place. Um, as his luck would have it, one of the other dancers quit, and Josephine was ready. I'm Sarah Fenske. Tomorrow, a St. Louis native is being inducted into a place of high honor, the Pantheon Mausoleum in Paris. That former St. Louisan, of course, is Josephine Baker. And that former St. Louisan, of course, is Josephine Baker. And that is her singing uh, Je Do on a 1951 album. The name of the song translates to I Have Two Loves. And by that, Baker meant her native country and Paris. Singer, dancer, and civil rights activist Josephine Baker was born here in 1906, and she became a French citizen in 1937. Lionel Couillet is a teaching professor in French and director of the Cultural Center French Connections at Washington University, and he explained what a big deal this Pantheon induction is. That is the ultimate honor, uh, because not only did Josephine Baker uh, receive the Legion of Honor, but uh, being at the Pantheon is the place for the greatest uh, person in France ever. And Josephine Baker is the first black woman to receive a Pantheon induction. Here's what Lionel Couillet said about her appeal. Maybe Josephine Baker represents for, for France not only uh, a link between uh, France and the United States, and, and for us, of course, a link between St. Louis and, and Paris, but I think she represents for the French a symbol of, of hope, a symbol of joy uh, that comes at the right time uh, now in France. And maybe she represents also a model of someone who succeeded and who represents a minority. And that is politically very important uh, right now in France when we are very close to the next presidential elections and when we see uh, the rise of uh, extremist uh, parties uh, on the right. And that is Lionel Couillet of the Cultural Center French Connections at Washington University. Washington University hosts a screening of a documentary about Josephine Baker this evening. And tomorrow, Graham Chapel Wash U will host an event honoring Baker's life. Details are on our website, stlonair.show. And joining us now with more on Josephine Baker's life is Lois Conley. She's the founder, president, and CEO of the Griot Museum of Black History. Lois, welcome. Hi, thanks, Sarah. How are you? So, Lois, Josephine Baker grew up not far from where I am today in Grand Center. This was in the Mill Creek Valley neighborhood. What do we know about her childhood in St. Louis? Oh, absolutely. She grew up in the same neighborhood that I grew up in. I'm so elated that, that we have that connection. But she, you know, most like many people at, during that time, grew up in a, a period of like, probably extreme poverty. Um family uh, came to St. Louis, uh, parents both from the South, uh, didn't have um, much of a a way to take care of a family. Daddy, mother married several times. Uh, The last time I think was to a husband who wasn't very uh, productive, um, wasn't a good provider for the family. So Josephine found herself uh, at a very early age out on the streets and and, uh, doing other things uh, in the community 
to help raise a little money to help support the family. And was that the start of her sort of finding herself in show business? I think that she probably felt that she had something in her, in, within her that could make her rise above her current condition. Mm-hmm. And I think the fact that, and I think we maybe uh, dismiss this fact that growing up in Mill Creek in that environment where there was a hub of entertainment, there were many opportunities for her to sort of go out there and spread her wings and test the waters. And I think that's just what she did. She took advantage of those, uh, certain, those environments. And she ended up in New York. Do, you, do we know what took her from St. Louis and from this, this uh, black neighborhood here um, to the Big Apple? Well, actually, she went to New York, I think, following her dream to, to become a, a dancer, an entertainer, and followed, um, went to New York to, to, to work in a, a black show in New York, um, where she <laughs> strived again to, against some odds to, to find her place. She wasn't re- readily accepted in, in the show. Um, so she worked as a, well, and again, they called her a, a dresser. I like to think of her as a wardrobe mistress. <laughs> but uh, she worked. Uh, again, until and tried to prove herself, she learned all of the all of the performance steps in the chorus line, so that she could, in fact, be able to take the place, um, her place when it became available. And, and as luck would have it, one of the actors, one of the other dancers, quit uh, the show, and Josephine was ready to step right in, and she did. It's sort of that classic Broadway story. She came back a star. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. And so did she become a star in New York or did it take going to Paris to do that? I think her stardom, I think she honed her skill uh, somewhat in New York and took advantage of, of opportunities to, to develop herself. But it wasn't, you know, because of all of the, the racism and the, the way people still to this day, the way that we still embrace African-Americans, she was not well received in New York and in the States in general. And it was not until she went to Paris where they pretty much accepted her with open arms, both her as a person and her as an entertainer, is where she, where she developed her fame. She never really quite uh, was accepted and given her props um, in the States. And what made her such a sensation in Paris? Well, I think at it, she went to Paris at a time when when they were looking for some a new uh, new breath of, of of life. They were they were enthralled by her um, courage, her 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 willingness to perform uninhibited. Um, I think that the fact that she was black even had a lot to do with the fact that she was expressive in a way that maybe uh, they were not accustomed to at the time. But she just forged ahead. She didn't let things stop her from from doing well. And she did well because she practiced. She practiced and made herself good at what she did, whether it was being um, a fine operatic singer or whether it was being a a comedic actor. She did it all well. So she didn't perform in St. Louis after she became such a big star until 1952. That's when she performed at the Kiel Opera House, which is now Stiefel. Uh, what were her feelings about her hometown? Well, she, obviously she left because her feelings were that she was not accepted here and was not going to be accepted here. And, you know, experiences throughout her life had proven that. So she just, and on, on the occasions when she did return to the United States, even after she had um, earned some fame in, and fortune in, in France, she, when she returned to the United States, she still was not accepted here be, simply because she was African-American. Uh, and so the time she did come back to the States, you know, to visit her parents, visit with her mom and, and other things, and even to, to, um, to perform, she would not because there was such a high level of segregation in, in the city still that she just refused to perform in those places that did not treat African-Americans well or did not treat her well. Hmm. And so she just simply wouldn't do it until um, she came back in 1952 and, I, and went to the kill. So and she, she had a huge audience of people there by that time who were willing to, to hear her and see her and accept her. And she became known as a real civil rights crusader. She spoke at the March on Washington. Uh, What did she say there? She actually, I don't have the transcript of what she said there, but I do know that she, because of her uh, activism prior to that, 
um, she was one of the one, one the one black woman who was allowed to speak. Uh, and I think it was because they felt that she really was sincere about her efforts and the, the need to change this this world. Um, she worked with very closely with Dr. King's um, um, group, and I think they were pleased to have her her stand before them and with them on an equal footing. So we'd be remiss talking about Josephine Baker if we didn't mention her heroism um, during World, World War II. She was actually a spy uh, for the French, the good French, not the Vichy French. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So what kind of impact did she have through that work? Well, I think it was important that, you know, even as, she, you know, she was a spy for the for the French and a good one, as you say, she was, again, uh, showing her sense of patriotism, her sense of um, appreciation for the human being, uh, the, her sense of wanting to uh, wipe out oppression in any form wherever she was. And I think that's what she was committed to doing. Uh, and, and I think even when uh, President de Gaulle met and, and talked with her, he understood that um, she had this kind of spirit that you could trust, that, that it was giving, a giving spirit that she wanted, and she was sincere about making an effort to change things. And that's what she did. So she was at one point one of the biggest stars in the whole world. Um, was her impact beyond that, the civil rights work and the work she did as a spy, was that fully appreciated during her lifetime? I think when you look at the combination of her life, it, everything that she did in her life is is what matters. It was she was not a single person. She was her her efforts were not single focused, singularly focused. I think her life was about making a difference, making a change, and so everything she did, I think, was focused on that. She, including you know the children and and the the fact that she gave money to different charities and the fact that she stood firm against you know racism and oppression in any form. I think all of that is who Josephine Baker was. And and I think that's what her legacy is, is that, you know, you, you live your life according to your beliefs and your convictions. And when you stand strong on those convictions, you can make a difference. So we should mention there are a host of events around town honoring Josephine Baker. Time to this Pantheon induction, which takes place tomorrow. That includes those events I mentioned at Washington University. Uh, there's also an event at the uh, Missouri History Museum. There's also an event at the Griot Museum, uh, which you're the founder, president, and CEO of. We have details about all those events on our website, stlonair.show. But Lois, um, beyond this this special event going on, you have a permanent exhibition at the Griot devoted to her life. What kind of information do you have there or artifacts do you have there for people who want to learn more about Josephine Baker? Absolutely. We do have a permanent exhibit and have had a permanent exhibit almost since our, our existence some 20 years ago. So we've always thought of her as someone who was worthy of mention and worthy of memory. Memory. Um, so you can come and, again, learn some of these same things we've talked about today, see some of her costumes. Uh, we reinterpreted uh, her not in a banana skirt, but in an elegant, um, you know, um, ball gown, um, typical of, of, of the lady who we think she really is and really who, really, who she really was. And uh, that, that, that is a permanent exhibit because we think her, her story and those stories of people like her need to be memorialized in a permanent way. I wonder even if, you know, if, if St. Louis and, and the rest of the country would be doing anything in her memory to this week if, <laughs> if they weren't doing something at the Pantheon. Hmm. And it, again, speaks to where we still are in this country in terms of race and race relations. We still do not uh, embrace the African-American people in the way that they need to be embraced. And it's, it's sad for our, our city. Well, Lois Connolly, I know you're doing your part to correct that at the Griot Museum. I encourage people to go check out that exhibit and also check out all these events. We have the details at stlonair.show. Lois Connolly, thank you so much for joining us today. And, and, uh, and Sarah, can I please say that our event is at Harris Stowe on, on um, December 3rd. It's not at the Griot. It's at Harris Stowe. We're doing it in, con in collaboration with Harris Stowe and the um, land on which we dance at Wash U. All right. And all those details, stlonair.show. Um, and Lois is the founder, president, and CEO of the Griot Museum of Black History. This episode was produced by Alex Hoyer with audio engineering by Aaron Dorr and production assistance from Jane Mather Glass. It was mixed and edited by Aaron. 
St. Louis on the Air is a production of St. Louis Public Radio. Understanding starts here. Do you find yourself regularly listening to episodes of St. Louis on the Air? Suggest us to a friend you think might enjoy our conversations. And leave us a review and rating on Apple Podcasts on the App Store. It's the simplest way to help people discover our show. Thank you. St. Louis Public Radio is a member-supported service of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, honoring Arbor Day on April 26th with an ongoing commitment to sustainable stewardship and conservation of Missouri's forests. Choosewood.com.